Welcome, everybody. This is our session on advising at Plymouth State University. I'm Matt Cheney. I'm Director of Interdisciplinary Studies, and I work here in the CoLab. And with us today is Kelsey Donnelly from the Academic and Career Advising Center, or ACAC, as we tend to call it these days. ACAC. Okay. ACAC. Okay. <laughs> Um, and we're going to run you through first a bunch of information. Like we're just going to overload you with information first so that you have a ton of stuff. But don't worry, all of this is going to be also available on the CoLab website, the whole PowerPoint that we use, plus some other stuff. Um, the resources will be available for you. That's the first part. The second part is then going to be us talking you through an actual workflow, what we do when a student shows up for an advising session, how we prepare for that, how we choose which uh, tools out of the many tools that we have to use. Because one of the great challenges Plymouth sets up for us as advisors is that there are lots of ways to access lots of information. So um, how do you actually work through that with students? We'll get to that first, but we're gonna, we're gonna start with overloading you with info uh, and then go into the, the process. So Kelsey, while I figure out how to get my uh, PowerPoint to share here. Do you want to talk about some of the elements that we have coming up? Sure. Oh, that was smooth. Yeah. Uh, so I guess one of the first things that we like to talk about is a lot of the times faculty don't know how students find things. They find things differently, so they don't necessarily know the workflow for students. And one of the first things that we like to start with is how do students, first off, how do they find out who their advisor is? And there is a whole bunch of ways. Hopefully, as an advisor, you reach out to your students early and often. So hopefully you've emailed out like prior to the beginning of the semester starting, letting them know, hi, I'm Kelsey, I'm your advisor. I will, you know, I'm here to help you along the way. Um, but if students don't receive that email, they can also find it by going to the Navigate app, which is something that we have all incoming students download. The Navigate app is really helpful. We as instructors and advisors don't have access to the app. You have to be a student, but it is really helpful to the student. They can see their advisor if the advisor is set up in Navigate to make appointments, Students can make an appointment right through that app, or if they can also see their schedule. And the cool thing about that, like especially in the beginning of the semester for new students, if they don't know where their classes are, it is like GPS to all the buildings. So it will walk you to the class and students utilize that a lot in the beginning of the semester. Another way that they can find their advisor is through degree works. Um, there's lots of information on degree work, so we'll talk more about that a little later on. But they can also find it on My Plymouth. Um, they're the new My Plymouth. I guess there's debate about what it's called now. It's either My Portal or My Plymouth or My USNH. I don't know. I'm gonna the new My Plymouth is what I'm going with. <laughs> It'll <laughs> always be My Plymouth. It is. <laughs> um, there is a it's a quick link and it's called Self Service PSU, and all students' academic information can be found there. So students would go to the self-service PSU tab. And again, we're front-loading a lot of information. We'll actually show you this tab a little bit later on. And the next thing students like to ask us a lot in the beginning of the semester, and maybe even now, is how do I find my schedule? That also can be found on the self-service PSU tab. Um, the same link as you find your advisor. It also can be found in the Navigate app. And even though we don't have access to the Navigate app, I've never really even looked at it because we don't have access to it. Students do tell me it's pretty um, self-explanatory. They they don't seem to have trouble figuring out how to use it. Yeah, like it's really cool. Like students can find like study buddies, like they can find other students in their classes who are looking to like find someone to study with. There's like to-do lists. There's lots of cool things for students. Yep. People like it. Then for us as faculty, how do we find lists of our advisees? And there are a few ways, and some of these change frequently, uh, and we've seen different types of screens and stuff. Um, but here's one one way to see them. One is is through Navigate. Um, our side of Navigate, it's pretty easy to see who you who is assigned to you as students. 
Um, there is also within uh, mindfulness under advisory services, um, under faculty banner, I have it as, as a list on my um, mindfulness that you'll see later on is um, in faculty is faculty banner. And I click on that, it goes to banner. It takes us to the faculty services first, but up top there's a button that it looks like you're already there because it's blued out. Um, that's advisor services, and that will take you to a screen that has a list um, you can access of all of your advisees as well. And we'll show you how to get to that. Yeah, this screenshot, actually, I, we will send these slides out, but if you wanted to take a screenshot of this one, this is how you filter out to get an accurate, an accurate list of all your advisees. When you first open it, it will show you a list of all students that you've ever been attached to. Like for me, that's a lot. <laughs> so I have to filter it out as these filters show up there to get my actual list. Of and advisees. I didn't the last time. So there's something weird going on with it. Apparently they're making it easier, um, but they haven't cut Kelsey up yet on that. <laughs> no, it still shows that Usually I have 530 you, you, <laughs> you get stuff before faculty do. I uh, know. But this, this time, is my touch. My, mine clicking on that link is actually accurate. Okay. But I mean, before we go on, like, honestly, 98% of the time I use my advisee list and navigate because it shows a list of all active students. So any students that is attending classes right now that I am their advisor for, I have a really quick way of like getting my list of advisees. I can text them and I can email them and pull information on them. So navigate is really it's great yeah for advising stuff navigate is really a great way to go and um there is a session on navigate after this one today but also if you want to really do a deep dive into navigate make an appointment with Kelsey uh it's fun stuff all right so another great question we get from students a lot is how to get to the registration system and again Plymouth has a few different ways to do that um so the first and easiest is uh, with the new portal to just type register into the search bar up top. Um, that's really easy and will take you right to, to a bunch of stuff. Um, you can do it from my phone as well if you wish to. I think that's probably one of the hardest ways to do it. Um, another good one is from the registrar's website. Um, right on the registrar's website on Plymouth.edu there is a link that says register for classes and that will take you to both the registration link and the browse for classes. We hit a certain limit of what we can see in the register for classes part, that's unless you're a student. Um, so students can sometimes see more there. It seems to change term by term what we have access to, um, but that is another way. Yeah, a lot of the time, like before, you know, faculty advisors never really had access to this Spanish registration system, but this new portal and having it on the registration system makes it accessible to everybody. So it's just really good for you to see how the student has to go in and register. I know a lot of us still use course search for various things, but students don't necessarily, they can't use that to register. So they go in this way and it's just good to help the student. Just knowing where that little tab that says add by CRN is, has been super helpful for me. Yeah. And we look up just the CRN numbers and the students and put those and it's easy. All right, so let's um, get into some of the scheduling that we face here. So advising weeks are coming up. We'll have two weeks of advising weeks starting Monday, October 16th until Friday, October 27th. These are times when students are encouraged to meet with their advisors. And there are lots of things that you can talk with your students about. Um, six week grades will have come out by that point. You'll have gotten six week grades for all of your advisees. Um, you can talk about options for second half of the semester courses. Uh, those start right around then. You can go over classes for next semester, uh, give them their PIN, the personal identification number that allows them to register. So you'll get a list of those for all of your advisees. And uh, that's really one of the big ways that we get them to contact their advisors and how advisors handle pins is up to them, um, but we like to use it as a way to convince students to reach out to their advisors. Um, and we encourage advisors not to simply give out the pin, but to actually have a conversation with their students. Check in also on their overall experience. This goes into holistic advising, which we'll talk about into a mo in a moment. 
um, helping them think about what's going on in their, their lives at Plum State. And then also for the sake of the university, track who plans to transfer or withdraw from school here. Uh, there are a few different ways to report that information, but it's valuable for Plymouth to know uh, when people are leaving. Okay, so the big question, how do we find PINs? So Kelsey, what's the news on PINs this term? <laughs> <laughs> uh, pretty consistent with last term. Um, we are able to find PINs on an individual basis. We could go in and look up each of our students and find the PIN that way by following the instructions on the slide, again, through self-service and the advising services tab. Um, however, there is no way to export a list through Banner right now of all of our students and our pins. So if you wanted to go in and look up each student individually when you're meeting with them, totally fine. Go to Banner and look them up. However, our office will send out all advisors a list of your advisees and the pins attached to them so you can have all your pins in one area like we are able to run a report it's just nothing that advisors individually can do so once pins are released we will send those out and that's going to be individual to advisors this term that's great yes last term because of staffing troubles you uh, yes. had to no. send everybody's pins. oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it was that it was all or nothing last semester yep. but we've we've stabilized yeah, <laughs> we will do individual great folks that's great news because that's a lot of work from your office. It is. So thank you for doing that. The registration process, um, the one that, especially for the fall, the one that matters most, you'll see uh, I, in the spring, we have some dates for the, the second two there, um, but it's much more, those are much more common in the spring than they are in the fall. Um, what most matters is that registration itself will open on Monday, October 30th at 7 a.m. Um, for undergraduate degree seeking students and all graduate students. There are some specific dates and ways that breaks down them. So new students and transfer students, I haven't actually been able to find the exact dates for this term when they come in. I could ask admissions, but it's not super important when the exact dates are. They are significantly later than uh, the currently enrolled students. So this matters a lot. Registration dates. So we break things down over um, a three week period, uh, really a four week period in many ways. Um, first off, on Monday, October 30th at 7 a.m. through Friday, November 3rd at 4.30 p.m., all athletes, presidents, and deans lists, students with 60 or more earned credits, and all students registered with Campus Accessibility Services will be able to register. That will turn off on Friday, November 3rd at 4.30 p.m. And then on Tuesday, oh, sorry, actually, then it'll open again on Monday, November 6th. On Tuesday, October 31st at 7 a.m. through Friday, November 3rd at 4.30, all students, uh, regardless of their standing with 60 or more earned credits will be able to register. Then that closes on Friday. Monday, we open up same thing, but for students with under 60 or more earned credits. Now, one of the key points here is about earned credits. Uh, students often don't distinguish between attempted credits, which include the credits they're taking this term and earned credits. But for the registration um, stuff, and really all things having to do with the registrar's office, um, earned credits are what matters. So it in, only includes the courses for which they've been graded, that they've received grades uh, and received the credits. Uh, so that's often when students will ask, why can't I register right now as a priority um, during this time? It's usually because they don't have enough earned credits. Um, and so Monday, the Mondays are really for athletes, presidents, and deans list students, as well as uh, students registered with accessibility services. And then Tuesday is for everybody with the, the right amount of earned credits. Then it all turns off and registration gets closed for problem solving week. We love problem solving week because we love solving problems. So, uh, and the biggest problem is financial holds. That's uh, number one, students won't realize they have a financial hold. They'll go to register for classes, they can't register. And so this gives us a week 
to work with students who need the time to work through student financial services or elsewhere um, to solve whatever problems are keeping them from registering. And then on Monday, November 20th at 7 a.m., registration opens up for everybody again um, from then until ad drop in the next term. So um, the challenge becomes for some students who want to register during problem solving week and can't, and there are, there are really no exceptions given out for that. I can think of one in the last few years that I know, oh, Office of Academic Affairs approved. But really, if students miss their registration window, um, for whatever reason, and, and there are legitimate reasons students miss their, their registration window, but they're going to have to wait until it opens up for everybody again on November 20th. Right. And this week is by design for that. We really yeah. want students to register during their week of registration. And if we say like registration ends, um, it's closed the 13th, you know, it closes on the 13th. You won't be able to register. It gives them a little more incentive to register on time, which is something we dealt with a lot in the past of students just waiting, you know, not taking it seriously, waiting until like way down the line to register. So this really has helped like encourage students to register earlier on. And that makes it so much easier to plan classes and we don't end up canceling as many courses for under enrollment. And yeah, it just, we really need them to register during the registration time. Yeah. Um, All right, so we wanted to talk briefly about, um, and we'll get back to questions and stuff about the registration times and things. Oh, one thing I did want to bring up is when uh, your office sends out the list of pins, mm -hmm. that in the past has included students' registration times on it too. Do you know if it's going to this time? Yes. Okay, so that's really helpful. You don't have to remember this complicated registration system because you'll in fact have the registration time for all of your students. That's also included when you look up their, their PIN individually, um, if you use that. All right, holistic advising. Kelsey, I, I just want to tell students to register for classes. What's yeah. wrong with that? Nothing. We really want students to register for classes. That is a very important job of advisors. However, we feel like the relationship building portion of advising is equally important. We want students to feel connected here as an individual and that they fit into the community and that they have someone to go to to help if things start, you know, sliding or if they encounter any challenges. So it's really good to like get to know the whole student, like deep dive into their experience at PSU, check in on their health, their physical, social, emotional, and mental well-being, like how are they as a human right now? Um, check in on academics, like how are each class is going? Do you have any challenges or any classes giving you a hard time? I know um, alerts just went out. That is another good time to reach out to our advisors. If you got any alerts on any of your students, reach out, see if there's anything you could do to help make their experience a little better. Maybe they help need help getting a tutor but just check in. But then also in your meetings, like let's look to the future. Like what do they want to do with their degree? Like getting to know why they're here is pretty essential as an advisor as well. Check in on their challenges, celebrate their wins, make sure they're getting involved. We have found over and over and over again that getting involved in campus is, it, it is great for their experience. It's good for retention. I don't know if that should be part of this, but like students stay where they feel a connection. Um, we did a survey uh, over and over, actually, we do this survey every year for students on probation. And we we're like, what, what things did you get involved with? Mm -hmm. And over and over and over, 100% of the time, the students that are on probation didn't get involved with anything. So we do find success in the students that get involved. There's Later on, you'll find a slide. I, it, we're not going to touch on it, but um, it, we have a new platform called the PAW, and it's where students can find all of the clubs. There's like almost 200 clubs here on campus. You can also find ways to find work study jobs and events. So, Student Life is doing such a good job this year um, with events and clubs and things that it's really, really valuable. And it's Retention is valuable to talk about because we all know, you know President Burks uh, emphasizes it all the time, 
so much of what we want to do and be able to do depends on how we're maintaining uh, good retention and uh, holistic advising, I think, is, is essential to that and helping students develop that sense of belonging. But at the same time, I, as a faculty member, go, wait a minute, I'm not a counselor. I'm not a social worker. How am I supposed to do this? And that's where the idea of the referral agent comes in. It's not that you're supposed to know everything there is to know about helping students with their mental health, with their sense of belonging, with everything. It's rather that we know the university. We know that there are lots of resources here. And educating ourselves better on who does what and what resources are available means we're able to then help students connect with those things when they need them. So here's a great list of conversation starters that uh, Kelsey came up with as things that you talk about when students arrive, because that's another part of it is like, what are these sort of icebreakers? How do student arrives in your office? We know to talk about courses. But how do you get started with the other stuff? So I, know. I love this list of questions because it just uh, gives you something to start with. What are some of your favorite questions to ask here? Yeah. Well, when I actually, why I started this list is because when I first started as an advisee, like I would find like conversation like dwindle out and I'm like, you know, always looking for like things just to get past the awkward. And I now have established pretty good. I kind of do rapid fire questions but it helps open students up and so my favorite you know I always start with how's your world how are things going how are your classes I love to check in on how their living situation is how are things going with their roommate one question I ask a lot and I never used to but I have become so shocked at the answer that now I ask it very frequently is are you eating it, you would really be surprised at how many times the answer is no. So like, I like to help students through that. Like if we need to get them connected with resources or talk about different habits, it is always a good conversation starter. I've been shocked by that too. I had a student who was only eating once a day because they didn't know how to schedule meals because they never really had to before. And that was an interesting conversation. It's like, it's not healthy. They were like, I'm just going to eat once a day. It's fine that's not fine that's not no. going to work for you maybe it's fine you know short term but that's not going to work out yeah no um so just knowing that and, and it wasn't a matter of not having access to food it was purely a time management issue really yeah. on their part they didn't know they'd never had to they were a younger student and they had all of this stuff that now they had to organize in their life whereas previously they were coming from a very regimented um high school experience and and Per, and home experience. Yeah. And then I think my number one favorite, if I had to choose one uh, one of these and only use that forever, it would be on a scale from one to 10, what has been your experience at PSU so far? And then I wait for the answer. And, you know, some will say seven. And I say, what will make it a 10? It really pinpoints like what are their pain points right now and you, you know deeper dives into their experience and kind of like come up with solutions and possible ways to change the scenario or just getting them to open up and talk about it is always a good thing to do. So we're not going to go over all of these um, because we have some links and all within the, the PowerPoint that you'll have access to after the presentation. Um, but there are some good, useful things here uh, um, for various advising situations. Um, for a GPA calculator, there are a few different ways to search for courses. We'll talk about that in, in a moment. Um, and the ACAC SharePoint, which has become a really great tool. You all have built it out really well in recent months. Um, and we'll show you the advising one note, note um, and templates and such in a moment. Degree works, we should talk about. We should talk about degree works. <laughs> so we can't show you degree works because that would be a FERPA violation. There is no uh, fake page on degree works that we could show you. Um, but if you, if really you're struggling with degree works, I, I would recommend making an appointment with Kelsey or even the collab. We all use it all the time um, to take you through. It's not a FERPA violation if we take you through with your own students. Um, but we can't just show you a random degree works page. So we sort of have to talk about it in the abstract. But DegreeWorks is a great way to um, start out advising. Once you've gotten through those conversation starters, 
I don't just like immediately open degree works. Like, Hello, welcome to my office. Look at your degree works. Um, but rather having degree works there and ready and available. If you're thinking about one tool to have ready for an advising conversation, um, degree works would be it for me because it lays out what they need to do, what they have done, and we can really begin to think about their journey. Yeah, it's great. Like it does. Like I explain it to students. I'm like, this is a layout of all of the classes that you need to take at your time here at Plymouth. And it's a checklist of the ones that you have taken just to make sure you're on track to graduate on time. So it is a tool that I open up with every student, especially during registration time. To find it is actually gotten a lot easier than it That's has been. I know this new My Plymouth, this new portal is really user friendly. So on the search bar, you type in degree works and you can pull up. It, it 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 will find it for you. I put it on a quick link so I can yep. just hit degree works. And there used to be so many tabs. It used to be so hard for students particularly <laughs> yeah. to find it. I mean, we would spend 10 minutes looking for it from their end and then I'd just make sure they bookmarked it. Yes. But, uh, much, much easier now thanks to the new portal. And a couple other cool things with degree works is that that has a what if function. So if students in your office and they're exploring other majors, you can use what if and change the major. So say um, they're psychology, but they want to explore business or business admin or something like you can put what if and you can put that major as business admin and it will show you the courses and how the current, the ones that they've taken applies to their new major that they're exploring just to see, you know, where things would land. It also now shows minors, which it didn't in the past. That's new and it is so helpful because you can see the classes they need for the minor and how they apply. The thing I explained to students about degree works is how the colors work. So green is good, red is incomplete, blue is you're working on it right now. Yeah. That seems to be enough to, to help them understand yeah. uh, it in a basic level. All right, so there's a bunch of other stuff in this PowerPoint. This is sort of a preview of, of what that is. We're not going to go over this stuff particularly because we want to show you some of the things we've been talking about in action. Um, but this is what it, the rest of the PowerPoint has, and you'll have access to that um, from the collab page once we get all the resources put up there. Perfect. Anything about these we should say before we? I think just one, um, helping students having academic difficulty. I did mention earlier, uh, but I kind of want to reiterate it again. Uh, if you could reach out as advisors to any students that you got an alert from right now, those early interventions really are key for helping students turn things around before it gets too deep into the semester. So that's just my plug. Those We had <laughs> 1,110 care forms or alerts submitted. One of them, you know, many are for multiple students, but that's a lot. So let's just that's from progress reports. Yeah, the progress reports. Oh, yeah. Wow. Interesting. I'm glad people are using them. Oh yeah. The, that's great. It's incredible. Like the engagement from you know professors noticing that there's an issue. It's so good. Now yeah. it's you know and I always tell students about this, don't panic. This is an early warning system about things we can fix because there's time <laughs> oh, where there so isn't good. even sometimes at six weeks. Right. All right. So we're gonna transfer over. Um, to show you some of our workflow. Um, Kelsey and I have slightly different workflows. We work with slightly different students. Um, but um, I will pull this up. All right. So I'm just going to show you in Firefox some of what I use. Um, for tools, this is, what I'm about to show you basically also works just the same in Chrome. Uh, so what I do is before each uh, session of advising weeks begins, when I know I'm going to have tons of student stuff and all, and I just need to be able to click when a student shows up in my office and get all of the things, um, I have a folder called advising that is uh, one of the bookmarks in the bookmark bar. and I can click open all in tabs and it will bring them up. Now I'm probably not signed into everything. But so for instance, this is all from last term. I haven't updated it for this term. So we have all of the pins from last term. I have an internal thing we use in interdisciplinary studies for uh, keeping track of, of how students are doing. Uh, I have our navigate page so that I can see that. 
uh, I have to sign in and we'll do that at some point when Kelsey's talking uh, to degree works. That's one of them. And then the other is uh, the advising page in banner. Um, and then this is just the general student registration page. So those are the things that last term I thought were useful. I'll probably change it up a little bit this term. Uh, I think everybody does it a little bit differently, but the things that I generally am going to want to be able to go to quickly, I just put into a folder in my browser and um, before advising weeks start. And then I've got it. I don't have to think about it again, and we can just plunge into advising. It's magical. <laughs> I love that process. Yeah. I didn't know the open all tabs existed before you, so thank you. I appreciate that. So. But I think I do it a little, yeah, why don't I'm you gonna sign, sign in, in. you um, share some philosophy and ideas? Yeah, um, I use the new My Portal a lot now just because I can create those quick links and we'll go show you some of the ones in a minute that we find really helpful for advising. Um, so I my process is very similar to Matt's. It's just I don't open all tabs up at once. I have a registration sheet that I hand a student and we'll go through their degree works and we'll check off all of the things that they've completed and we will write down the ones that they need to take for the next semester and on my like worksheet there's like a place to put the CRN and the course ID and the course name and the amount of credits so that when they sign up for it they kind of have all of the information right in front of them and then on that sheet it also has a place to put their pin I'll show you that sheet in a minute. Um, all right. Yeah. So I think that's all the things that I have. What should we now look at? Let's so see. we're in a IV search. Let's start here. Let's just go here. Oh. So actually, can you go to your um my USNH? Do you have that? Yes, open? that's what I have. I do have that. I still call it my device, Yes. So. All right, so yes, from here, you can see the shortcuts that I've added. So this is all the big stuff that we use, Navigate, DegreeWorks, um, Faculty Banner, ACAC, Registrar's Office. The Academic Catalog is really useful. I mean, in IDS, it's probably more useful than in other places, but I access the catalog all the time. Yeah. Um, this is the classic course search. There are a few different ways to search for courses. I like the classic one. I'll just click on that so you can see what it is. Um, just because it has under uh, advanced options, it has all sorts of stuff. And that's what you get if you search up top for course search. Um, it does go to that one. But right down there, it says register for a course. That's one that I use. That's the, um, you have the tab open. I just have it as a quick link. This is the view of where students go to register. So prior to the registration day's opening, students have to go to browse classes. And we as advisors can also go to browse classes and we can see a list of all classes open. Um, so select fall 2023. I'll just show you real quick what I've been showing students right now. So right now students are looking up half semester courses. That's where um, their interest is currently. So to find those, go to advanced search and scroll down. Yes, yeah, so sometimes you have to reduce the size of your screen in order to see all of it. It's just a wonky thing with the system. Um, but if you scroll down, there's that one that's called part of term and you scroll all the way to the bottom, second half, eight weeks, um, very, very bottom. There you go second half eight weeks and then i work with you know mostly first years okay yeah so then you can hit search or you can do open sections only or you can tear it down like a lot of these classes are going to be graduate courses so you could if you hit search again like you can make it so you only see one to three thousand level courses or whatever just to see i like this one because when you click on something you can you get this nice selection of stuff yeah like uh, course description most use. yeah instructor meeting times yeah so that's how and students are looking up classes 
And a lot of the times we as advisors don't necessarily use that. So I think it's important for us to know how students go in. On our SharePoint, I have instructions, step-by-step -step instructions on how students can look up classes. Um, if you want to. And that was just the tool for register for a course. Yes. So maybe from here, could we go to the academic um, and career? Do we go to ACAC? Do we have that? Yes. Academic and career advising. This is a tool that we are constantly enhancing. And over the summer, I, you know, we had a lot of like goals of what was, this was going to look like. And we have made a lot of steps towards those goals, but we're always enhancing it. But right now, if you could scroll down. And a little bit further, we're going to go to academic advising, faculty, and staff. So these are resources that we're looking to build to help advisors specifically. Um, the first one I'll show you is the how to advising guides. We have started uploading those. If you could just click on that one real quick. Yep. These are just kind of those like weird things that advise that advisors run into that they might not necessarily see every day um, but like if you're advising teacher certification students or like what's the difference between a BA and a BS in biology how do you declare a minor um, AP running start we have some that are going to be uploaded very soon on advising commuters advising um, students with military experience or ROTC it's just an advising athletes those are all ones that we're going to be uploading very shortly it's just kind of just those things that pop up. So if you have any ideas of things that you've run into and you would like a outline of you know how to advise, we're looking to enhance that quite a bit throughout the semester. And then the last thing I'll pull up here is advisor resources. Um, so I love so, this page. It has everything you need. I love this page too. So you see where it says. Uh, course registration instructions, fall 2023. Those are the step-by-step -step instructions on how students can go utilize the registration system. So even if you don't know it, you know, like the back of your hand, you don't really need to. Like, this is how students can get into degree work. This is how they can log into the registration system. How to look up composition or tackling wicked problem or how to look up their major courses if they already know the course ID. Um, and this is how they look up the directions courses because that can be a little tricky if you don't do it often. And this is how you look up the one credit PE classes and how you would remove a class from your schedule, how to find your schedule and how to register for varsity credit. So we, I encourage you to hand those out to a student. That's part of my process when I'm meeting with students during registration week. Uh, we'll update it for spring. This was just for fall, but we are gonna do an updated one for spring. And I hand it to the, I'll go over everything with the student and then I'll slide this across the table and I'll say everything I just went over is typed out. So they don't really have to retain it. Uh, another one that I will show maybe real quick is advising information notebook. Yes. This is something I have built out throughout the years that has just streamlined my life. I don't know if anyone uses OneNote. I say this all the time, but I should be getting money for how many people I encourage to use OneNote. Um, but it has organized my life drastically. So I, I use this to respond to emails or to give information out quickly. If students looking for like a contact information for something, or they have a question about financial aid, I'm like, I'm not sure the answer to that, but you should connect with financial aid, and I'll give them the contact information for financial aid. And this is just a pretty robust um, contact information. And it, an email template that I have used throughout, like I, I find that I have to keep writing the same ones over and over and over. You don't have to use mine, but it, you know, I have email templates, I have text templates, I text a lot. There's information about um, you know, deans and presidents lists, and so well, looks like that needs to be enhanced <laughs> a little bit. But just go through it. I won't go through all of them, but it's just stuff that we've built out in our office to help advisors. Great stuff. And there is a lot of like videos and how to's on Navigate. So feel free to look through those or feel free to just reach out to me and I can sit down with you and get you all set up. 
Uh -oh. So is that is that usually like everything we go over? I think so. Yeah. It's it's so much. I think it's useful now to think about you know where we start, what we do, um, and yeah. questions and such. So um, one of the things that I think about is you know how how do you begin? What do you want to be prepared for? For me, if all else fails, it's degree works, but I also like to yeah, have Navigate available. Yeah. Um, but then just talk with the student. And also each program is different. So I think talking with folks within your program is important because um, some programs already have some worksheets and things available for students about um, course sequences and those sorts of things. So there's a lot that's program specific as well. But let's open it up for questions if anybody has it. Not sure. How are we doing? Yeah, good. I'm not sure I have any questions, but um, I'm just going to be um, receiving a new batch of advisees um, since I've um, acquired a new move to a new um, program. And so I'm just. Um, I'm trying to keep a refresher on all things as I consider students who are not in the performing arts. And there were some real, uh, I liked seeing some of those sort of cheat sheet uh, <laughs> situations for students with certification or BA versus BS. Those are interesting because there's all those little idiosyncrasies for each degree program. So that's what I'm feeling a little bit nervous about, however, um, that being said, I do feel pretty confident about reaching out to faculty in those areas. And that stuff that's created, that's become more robust on SharePoint is just fantastic. I'm so excited to see that. I'm going to click all those things. Um, I think one of the things, if I were to think about a resource, like a place where I've been stumped, um, is with transfer students. So if there could be a little bit of a not stumped, there's just extra things. So like cheat sheets to like, what's the process for reciprocal course request? Um, you know, things like that, um, hot links to, to what we would need. And I know the folks have been changing um, too, who, who sort of deal with that content, but um, yeah, I am interested in transfer students because I was one and that is really beneficial. Like, how does that work? Or a non-trad, you know? Um, Those are good. That's a yeah, good idea. non trads is a would be a great. Yeah, transfers and non trads. Perfect. Yeah, we work with a lot of transfers in our office, inevitably because um, interdisciplinary studies can be a great way for them to preserve a lot of their credits. Mm -hmm. um, so, and those are a very different. It's just a very different conversation yeah. with transfers because it's looking over. Like, what do you do if something hasn't come in or it didn't come in to where they expected it to? Or, that came in as a directions and they want to have it in their major and that sort of thing. So right. those are all all questions that come up and are uh, can be difficult to know who to even ask about. Yeah. Good That'd be interesting yeah. for um, you know, somewhere down the line, another little specific session around advising those kinds of students. Um yeah. yeah. I don't have any right at the moment, but I'm thinking about this new batch that I could have, and I am open to that. I just want to be able to serve them well. So, <clears throat> yeah, but this is great. Really, yeah. um, <laughs> talk about an art. Advising, I feel like, is such an art, and um, uh, it's hard to have a converse, like, um, not hard. What's the word? It takes time to build trust. Right. between an advisor and a student. And so having those questions, you know, Kelsey and Matt, that you're laying out, like here are some pathways in to the conversation, not just to jump into the degree works. Because sometimes if you have like 25 advisees or boy, Kelsey, you have millions of advisees, right? It's like, ah, eh, you just want to get to the nitty gritty because you got to move on to the next one. So how do you um, sort of plan for how you're going to roll that short amount of time that you have to see them and work with them. So, 
Interesting. Sometimes students only want that too. I have definitely have students who are like, can you just email me my pin? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I have students who I'm like, yeah, you're fine. I'm just going to email you your pin. Yeah. Yes. Um, but for the for the most part, the ones who usually just ask that are actually students. I'm like, no, I'm not letting you take any. any yes. Let's have a conversation. All right. Right. Yeah. I mean, PINs are an ongoing conversation. Um, we've had it at the Academic Affairs Committee on the Advising Task Force, um, whether to get rid of PINs altogether because they can be annoying, especially when students are know what they need to do. But we've always come back to keeping them because they, um, one, they encourage those students who otherwise might not contact us to do so. Um, and they give us a little bit of leverage when we need students to do something. For instance, we had a student who needed to transfer out of IDS to finish with really needed to be in one of the regular majors kept saying yes I'm going to declare that yes I'm going to declare that not doing so and coming back to us for advising it's like we can't advise you anymore because I don't know the ins and outs of that program you need to get advising from them um, and they got really mad because I wouldn't give them their pen until they changed majors um, but it was the only way I could get them to do that so that they could then get the best advising possible. Um, so sometimes the pin as a, as a tool of coercion is, um, is our last resort. Yeah. And one thing we didn't mention, the change of major thing you just reminded me. Now on the change of major and the change oh, yeah. on the declaration of minor forms, there's a link to the coordinators right on it. So a lot of the times, like, it's tough to find, like, who needs to sign this? I don't know who to send the student to, but now the student and the faculty advisor can click on the link and see who needs to sign this form. Yeah, big thanks to the registrar's office for putting that on there, because um, that was a thing. If you didn't know where the list of program coordinators was, you would never know who needs to sign this form. I do think, too, um, for the future, this could be something that the home program helps support. But um, one of the registration struggles is with tackling a wicked problem and understanding the theme for each course because it's sort of buried in banner and that's challenging. So uh, John Krukeberg's been, um, Kathy LeBlanc had been thinking about that and John Krukeberg is continuing to think about that. And we had talked about how to connect that information or send it out or share it. So that might be something like a, um, a live link to section descriptions that could land in the SharePoint each semester yeah, or something. Actually, you know? We already do that. We do that for okay. comp and WP right. uh, and right. directions courses that has the description right there. So Beautiful. that's on our SharePoint um, at the beginning of each uh, registration. System. Beautiful. Yes. Then I'm going to go there instead of yeah. John. Questions <laughs> yeah, really can be answered by the ACAC SharePoint at this point. That's, <laughs> that's awesome. the goal. Resource. We're really looking to make it so that it's a one stop resource for advisors. One of the challenges I think we as a university have to keep working on is just discovering classes because we especially face this with newer classes um, is how do students find out about them? We, we don't have a good sort of central repository um, except for if you want to go to the the classic course search there is a link up top to get a spreadsheet of all courses currently offered um, but that's pretty overwhelming but yeah um, something we're we need to keep thinking about and talking about among ourselves is how do students find courses especially when they're new and if they're not part of their major and the regular course sequence right like what these courses that could be utilized as electives yeah uh, but there's some really fun to stuff for them. There is. Sometimes great courses get canceled for under enrollment that would have run if more people knew about them. Yeah. Yeah, let's brainstorm that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to end the recording here. Um, Thank you. Though. This has been a great, uh, great session. But um, we'll just finish by saying if you have further questions about any acad any academic advising tool or anything advising related, um, don't hesitate to reach out to Kelsey or anyone in the Academic and Career Advising Center, um, as well as us in the collab, but we're always happy to talk about advising. We love doing it. <laughs>